and there are several ways for the public to watch and to participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. Public members can also stream the meeting live on our website and also on YouTube if you search City of Capitola. As always, the meeting is also cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast channel 25. Thank you. Um, our technician this evening is Walter. Thank you, Walter. And thank you, Mayor Story. Great. Thank you, Chloe. And uh, yeah, thank you, Walter, uh, for being our technician this evening. Uh, with that, let's uh, have a roll call, Chloe. Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Councilmember Brooks. Here. Councilmember Peterson. Here. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. And Mayor Story. Here. Uh, Thank next you. We'll, yes, um, uh, let's um, uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance and I'll ask uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser to lead us in that. Thank you, Mayor Story. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, yeah. <laughs> for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you for leading us in that. Um, um, the next item on our agenda are uh, a couple of presentations. So I'll turn it over to uh, staff to uh, uh, make some introductions and a presentation. Thank you. Is it, is it can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah we can hear you pretty well, Captain okay. Ryan. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Sarah Ryan, Captain with the Capitol Police Department. Um, it's good to see you, Mayor Story, and other council members and city staff. I'm honored to actually introduce these four new officers to you. Um, they're bringing a tremendous amount of life experience to our community and our police department. So before I bring them in here uh, one at a time, I just want to make one comment. And I, you see me glance this way. They're, they're, they can hear me, and they're standing outside my office. It's a little unique for me because it's the first set of officers that's come through that I'll never have the opportunity to work the street with. And it's just a different place in time um, for all of us. But with that, I want them to know that I have a really strong commitment in assisting them to reach their goals and personal and professional in any way that I can help. And I'm gonna tell you something that you probably hear me say over and over again and other people have heard me say, the beauty of Capitola is not magic, but now you're a big part of what makes this community special. And if you ever need to be reminded why, then I have to warn you, you can come and see me, but be, pre be prepared to sit in here for a while because I'll let you know why. So I'm gonna introduce them in order um, of seniority because that matters, especially when you're new. So at first I'd like to start with Officer Daniel Vasquez, if you could come in here. So Daniel Vasquez has, uh, Officer Vasquez has been off training now for some time. He um, grew up in the Watsonville area he attended UC Davis where he got, uh, he received his degree in biochemistry and Latino studies. Um, very smart gentleman here. He was a nutrition counselor with the WIC program and also was a medical assistant for Salud para la Gente in Watsonville. He worked security for a while and um, he had a baby boy last December. So his boy is one now. Um, we welcome him here. He, uh, he's done an excellent job and um, his, he has this magical smile and ability to communicate with the public. So welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. And next um, introduction is for Noah Sharon. All right. Officer Sharon. Um, 
Well, we've known Noah for a long time. He was actually an explorer here many years ago. Uh, he attended Harbor High and Cyprus. He went into the army for a while. So we hadn't seen him for a, a little bit. He did some growing up out there. And then um, also, then he worked at Outdoor World where we started interacting with him more in the city of Capitola. Um, he left Outdoor World and he went to state parks and then came back to us um, to work for the Capitol Police Department. And of course, we were really excited to wel welcome him into um, our police community and, and the Capitol community. So welcome. And he should be getting off training soon and we'll be excited to see him out there. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Glad to be here. Right. Thank you. Sure. All right. Next, Abraham Camacho. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, Officer Camacho, he grew up in um, the Soquel area. He currently lives in Watsonville. He attended uh, San Jose State and graduated with a degree in communication studies. He worked security at the boardwalk, um, where he really excelled and did well and came, came to us with a lot of a tremendous skill set and understanding of the laws and community relations, because um, that could be a challenge, that's a challenging position. He's doing very well here. And we look forward to him uh, completing his training program here very soon as well. Welcome. Thank you, Captain. Glad to be here. Mary. Last but not least, come on in. Jaime Ponciano. Welcome. Um, Jaime, Officer Ponciano, recently started with us. He's in week two, I believe. Um, he grew up in the city of Watsonville. He has two young children. He previously worked for Santa Clara County Corrections, um, where he gained a lot of valuable experiencing, experience working with inmates, um, programs, as you know, in custody or programs for rehabilitation, um, and also working with all the allied agencies in Santa Clara County. We welcome him and look forward to getting to know you better as you move through our community and our agency, and we're really glad you're here. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Okay, last but not least, we are, um, every year we present the Herb Ross Award and it's our Officer of the Year Award. It's for 2021. I want you to come back and just one last one. I'm very, very happy to announce that it, we, the award has been presented to Officer Jackie Young, who I'd like to also share recently had his first child probably how four, many, days ago. four days ago. So we welcome baby girl Brooklyn into the world. And we're so excited um, and to see him be a father. It's going to be great. Thank you. Um, so Officer Young grew up in Santa Cruz County, graduated from Harbor High School. Officer Young has been, was a police explorer with the Capitol Police Department. And he sought an opportunity at Sacramento PD. Officer Young was hired by Sacramento PD and attended their police academy. In 2015, Officer Young was hired by us. He came back to us. And he has held the assignments of patrol officer, motor officer, field training officer, range master. And soon he can add detective to his resume. He'll be transitioning in there um, once he comes back from spending time with his baby. Officer Young always maintains a very high level of professionalism and selfless dedication. I'd like to welcome Officer Young as our 2021 Officer of the Year. Thank you. You're I think he has a couple of things you might want to say to you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and fellow council members. Uh, I would just like to talk about the award a little bit, um, and specifically Sergeant Herb Ross. Uh, Although he was before my time here at the Capitol Police Department, uh, in talking to everyone, Sergeant Herb Ross was a believer in taking care of the community. Um, that's uh, what everyone has said who's had the opportunity to meet him, work with him, or interact with him in the community. So he holds a standard of high integrity and leadership within the community. And that's what this award uh, is about. Uh, although he's passed away in 2001, uh, he's still uh, known to carry on that leadership and to, for everyone to receive this award, future on his legacy is still continuing. With that being said, I'm honored to be receiving this award. 
I promise this is going to carry on and to set an example for the next officer to receive this award and for the years coming. So thank you. Right, thank you. Um, do council members um, have any um, comments at this time? They're all lined up. If you have anything to say, they'd be able to hear you. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I saw um, uh, council member Peterson. Thank you. I just want to welcome all of our new officers. Thank you so much for uh, just deciding to serve our city. We're so lucky to have you join us. Congratulations, Officer Young. Um, so, so excited to have you um, honored in this way. And thank you also for your service and congratulations um, on, on your new baby. Um, just all of you, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm just so very glad that you're all here serving our community. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I just wanna also echo what Council Member Peterson has just shared. I want to welcome all of you to Capitola and the Capitola Police Department. I have the privilege of seeing many of you drive by my house on a daily basis. And so um, it's exciting to see new faces and especially exciting to see such a diverse uh, group of representation of, of, of police officers representing our community, um, which I truly believe helps um, us bridge that gap between, um, between having our families and our community really appreciate and love um, what our police officers do. So welcome aboard. And for Officer Young, wow, this is such a huge award and I am thrilled you are the recipient of it. So hats off to you and thank you for all that you've done for the city of Capitola. Thank you, Council Member Brooks. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. You're, you're on mute, Council Member Bertrand. I think um, I'm gonna go ahead to council member Kaiser while. Um... Thank you, Mayor Story. And um, just wanna do a quick congratulations to everybody. And thank you for joining our awesome city that we all love so much. And your hard work does not go unnoticed. And especially in the times that we've been dealing with right now and cannot thank you guys enough for um, stepping up to the challenge and officer young congratulations on so many accounts and just thank you guys and keep doing the good work thank you all right thank you and uh, i'll come back to uh, council member bertrand thanks um you know uh, it was such a wonderful introduction by the captain and you know it just led me to believe that you know the whole organization has been just the perfect place It's attracted people and the people that have risen to the occasion to receive awards. I mean, it's just very indicative of the department as a whole. I also look forward to meeting everyone individually, maybe if um, possible, do some ride alongs. It's the best way to learn the city and also get a better chance to um, meet and um, you know make myself acquainted to the people on the force and the people that came tonight Definitely look forward to meeting them. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. And, uh, and, and let me just, I, I would like to welcome um, Officer Vasquez, Officer Sharon, Officer Camacho, and Officer Ponciano. Um, uh, one, uh, to uh, be entering into the profession of public safety. I don't think that there uh, could be a higher calling um, you know, in our society. Uh, than providing safety in our community um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and having us feel safe, not actually be safe, but uh, feel safe. Um, um, and in addition to that, uh, joining the Capitola Police Department. Um, it is a um, uh, exemplary um, organization um, and we're very proud that you have chosen uh, to become a part of our uh, community. Um, and I look forward to uh, seeing you in the community as well. Um, 
And I also just want to mention, I think that um, uh, Officer Vasquez, um, Captain Ryan mentioned he uh, um, formerly worked with the WIC program. And, um, and I believe that um, I um, uh, also, I used to work at the WIC program and, and we had a relationship uh, at that time as well. So uh, welcome to you all. Um, and for Officer Young, yeah, congratulations on, on so many levels. Um, you know, um, Officer Ross um, was an exemplary uh, officer uh, in our community. Um, you know, um, Councilwoman Peterson certainly knows more about him than I do uh, and the things that he did, but um, he, he really exemplified, I, I think, the highest standards of, um, of law enforcement. Um, and you're stepping in uh, and receiving that award, I think it's just a demonstration of your commitment and service over the many years. Um, and I find it particularly gratifying that, um, um, you know, you are a Santa Cruz uh, County, um, um, you know, person um, who is um, receiving this award. Um, and the other thing that I, you know, I think that you should be proud of that this is by peer selection. Um, so it is, um, the best among us have selected you as the uh, as the uh, exemplary example um, in a, in making this award to you. So congratulations! Um, and one final congratulations, um, I think, is in order because um, I like seeing that Captain Ryan. Uh, I don't think that I have uh, had seen that before the end of last year. Uh, so congratulations, Captain. Um, and um, I think that we are all so very proud of, of our police force. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Now we'll move on to the, our city attorney um, and for a report on closed session. Council members, a closed session was had on the items on the agenda and no action was taken. Thank you. I'll ask the city clerk if we have any additional uh, materials or information. Not this evening. And are there any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. All right, let's move on to item six then. This is oral communication by members of the public. This is opportunity for members of the public to address the city council. Uh, on items that are on our consent agenda tonight um, and or items that are not listed on our agenda tonight. Uh, if you would like to speak, raise your hand using the Zoom application or you can dial nine, star nine um, on your phone. Uh, our un moderator will unmute you and you will have three minutes to speak. Um, or um, anyone may send an email to us now, um, just address it to public comment, one word, at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, and the emails will be read for up to three minutes. Um, is there anyone that's, um, that wishes to speak um, on uh, uh, items not on tonight's agenda? Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised for this item, and I have not received any emails on this. Okay, well, let's move on then. We'll now go to um, staff and city council comments. I'll begin with staff comments. I don't believe I have any comments for you this evening. Welcome to 2022. Happy New Year. Um, are there uh, council comments? Um, council Member Peterson. Thank you, Mayor Story. I have a couple comments uh, this evening. Um, let's see, okay, I'll start with the, uh, the easier ones and then move into the, the more complicated stuff. So um, I'll start by sharing that on January 26th, I'm gonna be part of a panel put on by um, uh, a group called Women in Leadership for Diverse Representation, uh, Wilder, 
which I believe uh, Council Member Brooks is is part of their uh, steering committee or, or overall you know group that puts on these kinds of programs. Um, it's going to be a virtual forum that helps encourage women to serve in positions of leadership in the county. Um, it's going to be discussing considerations when deciding to run for office, how to support women that are running. Uh, there'll be a review of the positions that are going to be open for the 2022 ballot. Um, uh, our, our former uh, county clerk, Gail Pellerin, is also in, involved with this and, and a bunch of other really uh, inspirational women who have either served in elected leadership positions or encouraged women to run, et cetera. And so um, that's going to be exciting. I encourage you to uh, look up the organization uh, on Facebook or just Google uh, Women in Leadership for Diverse Representation, WILDR, uh, for more information about how to register. It was also recently in the Good Times. Um, and if you go to the Good Times website, there is a link to register if you'd like to participate in that event. Uh, the next item, um, I'm hoping to ask staff for a future agenda item. Um, in working with some of the cities that I work with in my day job, um, I came across a program that the city of Mountain View has, and it's a youth mayor for a day program. Um, and it's a um, uh, it's an essay contest for elementary, middle and high school students. Um, and then the essays come back to the city, either city council, city manager, we would determine, you know, who who reads and and um, and judges these essays. But the essay is about how the students would um, improve the city if they were mayor for a day and then um, a, a student from each uh, grade level or, or from elementary, from middle and from high school are chosen and those three youth become the youth mayor for a day. And it's something that I would really like uh, for us to look into. I know we don't have a high school in our city, but we do have high school students uh, clearly that live here. And so if uh, staff would be willing to look into the kind of resources that it would take for us to have this kind of essay contest so that we could have three youth mayors for a day every year, I think that would be really exciting. I'm always trying to encourage young people to be engaged with their city and with the government so that we can kind of create this pipeline of youth leaders that will at some point uh, replace us all. So if that's something that can go on a future council agenda, agenda just to determine what it might look like if we were to do something like that. Um, and, and there's no rush, just whenever staff might be able to uh, take a look at that possibility. So that was the easy and fun stuff. Now is the uh, little bit more difficult stuff. So last night was the, uh, the meeting of the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, AMBAG. And I've been mentioning this for several months now that AMBAG works on our uh, RENA assessment, our regional housing needs assessment for Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And we're in our sixth RENA cycle that runs from 20, or preparing for our sixth RENA cycle that runs from 2023 to 2031. In our fifth cycle, 2015 to 2023, the city of Capitola was assigned 143 housing units that we had to zone for and show that we were prepared to allow these 143 housing units to be built if a developer came to us and wanted to build them. Um, at last night's meeting was a vote on the methodology to determine how many units each city within our region was going to get. And after a couple meetings with um, city manager Goldstein and our community development director, Katie, I, uh, we, we fought really hard to try to ensure that the methodology that moved forward was one that made sense for our city, for the size of our city, for the developable, developable land that we have, uh, et cetera. And so we were fighting for a methodology that would have given us about, I think it was 700 units, and that was the lowest option. Uh, unfortunately, we were not successful. Um, I and five other cities voted against what ultimately did pass. And what did pass was a methodology that would assign the city of Capitola 1,336 new housing units in the upcoming RENA cycle. And so for those of you doing the math, and I didn't, but luckily there are websites who do it for me, that's a 694% increase from the number of housing units that we had to plan for in the last RENA cycle. So Again, I'm, I'm going to continue to bring this up because I feel like it's going to be really important because we're going to have to start changing our uh, housing element. We're going to have to update our housing element. The final 
RENA methodology is now going to the California Department of Housing and Community Development for approval. And come October, I believe it is, it'll all be final. And we're going to be expected to show a new housing element in the coming years that identifies that we're prepared to allow for 1,300 new housing units. And so again, along with new state laws regarding um, infill development and density, et cetera, I, I just don't want anyone in the public to be surprised if suddenly they, they find that we are zoning uh, in a way that allows for higher buildings or denser um, complexes, et cetera. So again, I'm just gonna continue to put this on our radar that this is something that won't come out of the blue next year. It's, it's happening and it's happening now. So I wanted to share that with everyone that the methodology did pass uh, through AMBAG last night and the process will continue and I will continue to provide updates as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for reporting that out to us, uh, Councilmember Peterson. We're going to have our challenges before us. Uh, I'll now go to Council uh, Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I don't know necessarily if this is a future agenda item for full council or what this would look like in response to council member Peterson's report, um, but it would be interesting to learn more about what other cities are doing from here on out. I know that the vote took place, but what are next steps? What are responses cities can take? What kind of measures um, that the cities can do who are being affected by a 670 something percent increase? Um, so maybe that could come back to us um, information wise or um, at a later time. Um, I also would like to request a future agenda item on an update to the new congressional lines um, that affect the city of Capitola um, from staff. And then um, it's been all over the new green waste re uh, disposal of what is it called? The food stuff. Um, what I understand is that we are all supposed to be getting special bins. This was presented to us months ago, but what I'm hearing is that the green waste is backed up on getting these bins. So it'd be nice if the uh, staff could report out on where that is and what communications um, are sounding like with green waste uh, so that we can uh, be a resource to our community um, on, those, on those matters. So those are the three items I have this evening. Thank you so much and happy new year, everyone. Thank you, Council uh, Member Brooks. Um, let's see, uh, Council Member Bertrand. Can you hear me, Council Member Bertrand? Oh, now I can. Yeah, I have a choppy uh, reception for some reason. So, um, Today, I was at the RTC meeting and in closed session, um, uh, also um, Tristan's on the uh, board too, but in closed session, we discussed the issue of um, making an application to the Surface Transportation Board to do adverse abandonment of the Felton branch line, uh, which is distinct from the branch line that we're on here in Capitola. So, this is part of a negotiation that we've been taking for a long time to try to work with the, uh, the, felt, um, the folks at Roaring Camp to push the uh, idea and the success of having an interim trail on the branch line that we currently are uh, running uh, through the RTC. So I'll have more on that. Um, I think if people are interested in this issue, the staff report would be a good way to start. Um, it's pretty complicated um, because um, negotiation issues and concerns and uh, issues of um, progressive, our own issues, how we have to actually end up paying for this. You know, it's, it's quite a long process. I'll have more later. Uh, this is not the end of the show, but this is the start of a discussion. And um, so, like I said, I'll get back to you more on this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Um, seeing no other council members with their hands up, um, I'll close this uh, part of the agenda out by reporting on the uh, Arts and Cultural Commission that met uh, last Tuesday, January the 12th, um, and um, some of the items that the Arts Commission discussed were, one, beginning to plan for 
uh, the summer concert series. Um, hopefully they will be able to move forward. We're being optimistic. Um, as well as um, they discussed uh, making a project out of, uh, if some of you may be aware, there's a very large tree that fell in the lower parking lot that has left a very large stump, um, which seems to be right for some form of art project. Uh, the first phase of that project is going to be trying to uh, preserve that stump uh, from further deterioration until we come up with a plan uh, to develop um, an art project uh, out of it. Um, and um, we did hear a report about uh, the plein air that took place um, last November. Um, and, you know, in spite of the pandemic, this was one of the most successful plein airs that we've had uh, in terms of art sales. There were $24,000 uh, in uh, capital art uh, that was sold. Um, at the culmination of that event. So that uh, will um, conclude my report on the Arts Commission. Um, and with that, let's move on to the uh, consent items on our agenda. Are there any members of the council that would like to remove a consent item? Seeing none, I'll entertain a, a motion to approve the consent item. This will be done on one motion. I move to approve the consent items. I can we, have a, we have a motion by uh, Council Member Tran and a second by Council Member Kaiser. Um, can we have a roll call vote, um, Chloe? Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Consent items all pass unanimously, uh, which brings us to the general government uh, portion of our meeting tonight. Um, and we'll start with item A, um, which is the Capitola Branch Library project notice of completion. The recommended action is to approve the notice of completion for the Capitola Branch Library project um, at a final cost of $13,190,813 and direct the Public Works Department to one, record the notice of completion and two, release the retention held in escrow in the amount of $369,724. Um, can we have a staff report? Steve, you're going on this one? I am. First, I'd like to thank you, Mayor Story and council members, and wish you all a happy new year. And I'll see if I can share my screen better this year. You all seeing my screen now? Hope so. So this is a report on the Capitol Branch Library. It is uh, construction with auto is complete. Um, just give you a very short background here. The uh, project began in January of 2019 and construction was completed in December, this past December, 2021. In between, we had lots of projects, lots of issues, but we issued 19 contract change orders. $847,000 was reduced from the construction contract to value engineering. This is an effort we took at the very beginning of the project when the bids came higher than anticipated. Um, but we did award a contract to auto construction and working with the architect and engineers and the contractor, we were able to reduce it almost by $850,000. As the project went on, there was um, always anticipated to be some change orders. There was a total of $1.7 million added to the contract. Um, as you got, as the council is aware, $1 million, uh, $1 million of those added costs were due to the delays of the project caused by the conflict with the power lines. The final cut construction cost was $13,190,813. $8, so rather than show you a bunch of pictures, you've all seen a lot of pictures and I know you've all been there. I just thought I'd cover the finances on the project as we're closing it out now. 
So looking at the revenue first, we have the original budget. So this one before we hired anybody, before we uh, really began working on it, we had a, a budget of $15,150,000. And over the probably past four years, because we spent a couple of years getting ready and figuring out where we're going to put it, probably four or five years, um, the, that revenue has increased uh, by $1.381 million. So that's all good. And you can see where our budget is as we are closing it out is at $16,500,000. On the expense side, we started with original budget of $14,195,300. Again, this was before we hired any contractors or architects or anything like that. As we final the project, you can see we've had increasing costs of over $1.5 million. Most of that have been in construction costs, not just the construction costs from as we've been in construction, but we never hit this $11,700,000 budget on the construction. I think the bid came in at $12,250,000. We reduced it down a bit and then keep adding it on. So you can see the final expenses here of $15,765,903. The fund balance or contingency as we've gone through the project initially started $954,000 and ended up at $765,000. So our cost exceeded our revenue growth by about $188,000. I wanna mention just so we're all aware, there is still some work being done on the site by staff, by city staff, it does not involve auto construction. So we're doing a notice of completion and closing out autos contract. We are working on signing and redoing the striping in the parking lot. Um, a lot of the signage changes have taken place and we're hoping to get the striping changes done this month. We are looking at the driveway safety. We uh, received a report very recently on uh, some ideas to do with that. Um, we'll be bringing that to council in the near future. And we're also working on putting a railing on the back deck, back deck along the edge along um, Clare Street. This is something the library's requested and something we actually worked on during construction, but uh, weren't, weren't able to get it completed. So we're gonna try and get that completed using other resources than auto construction. So um, a discussion on the fund balance uh, will be part of the mid-year budget review. And I'll take my first poke at it to, remind, to let everybody know that the Rispin Park project, um, our grant was unsuccessful. We had a uh, $425,000 grant through the Parks Department, State Parks. Unfortunately, it was not awarded. And so funding right now, I believe, is about $300,000 short. As we move forward, let's just keep that in mind. So it's been a while. I think we showed this uh, video here when we first started. Um, I thought it was kind of appropriate time to run through this. Just a time-lapse photography of, of the site over the two and a half years. This doesn't quite make it to the end, but you can see the site building grew. We switched locations to the other side of the parking lot. You can see the site improvements going in. Can't see what's going on in the building is probably the most important part. That's pretty close to where we ended up. The landscaping's in. Uh, we're still working around the, the library interior and the site. So I thought that was worth our time. So the recommendation tonight is to approve the notice of completion of the Capitol Branch Library Project constructed by Auto Construction at a final cost of $13,190,813 and direct Public Works Department to record the notice of completion and release the retention held in escrow of $369,724.39. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, Steve, has there been any discussion about, or I can't remember if there were was any discussion about the park on the property, um, the, the play structure and why that wasn't upgraded along with the library at the time. Now that we're seeing funds, I'm just thinking about future priorities for council um, and wondering if this was a part of the conversation. Mayor, or Council Member Brooks, that was never um, part of the discussion was to maintain it. We, we definitely discussed whether we wanted to relocate the park equipment or, you know, remove it and expand the library site to take it in. But we never did talk about 
redoing the library or the top lot as part of the library project. Certainly something we could undertake uh, at this time if we wanted to. I will mention that there is a lease for the property um, with the county to run the library and to maintain, and they are responsible for maintaining the site once we get those last few items I mentioned taken care of. But the city does maintain responsibility and maintenance for the top lot itself. Okay, so the city of Capitola is still responsible for that piece of the property until we vote today? Is no, so the I'm lease has you? already been approved. Right, the 99 year or the 100. Right. Right. Okay. So the county's already in. This is just closing out auto constructions contract. So for clarity, if we wanted to see, and maybe Jamie, you can help me with this too, is um, if we wanted to see um, an updated tot lot, is that something that the county of Santa Cruz has to take on or the city of Capitola can? That would be our project. So that that's something we can look at in future budget appropriations, but the tot lot is our responsibility. It's outside of the lease. So we, we control it. And since this money is allocated currently for the library that we're about to release into the general fund, is this the time to, to say X amount before we release it? Because this is part of the library project. Would this be an appropriate time to do so? My recommendation would be to do it. We're going to have a number of different uh, budget hearings coming up here shortly. We're going to be doing the mid-year report. Then we're going to talk about our goals for next year. And then we're going to get into budget hearings. We, we have significant resources and fund balance. So my recommendation would be to do it then. Um, you're going to have a lot of opportunity to talk about your project priorities at those meetings. Even though this is currently allotted specifically for the library, I'm just curious about it getting lost once it's in general fund. Um, um, before it gets back to general fund, since this is library dollars, this tot lot is part of the library. I'm just wondering if it's easier to do it now. I think it's really council's discretion of whether we release it back into the general fund and leave it. You could leave it in the library project fund, um, but we will have resources to talk about funding different projects coming up here in the next three months. Okay, so uh, Mayor Story, when we come back, uh, for conversation, we can discuss it then um, so I can get a feel for what council is thinking. Thank you for answering my questions. Okay, I just want to make sure that we stay within uh, the agendized item uh, for this evening. Um, since there was no notice, you know, concerning the top lot and the allocation of the um, surplus, you know, budget. But I'll move on to um, uh, Council Member Bertrand. So Steve, um, it looks like the distressed oak tree is doing well. Any word on that from Arborist or have you checked that? And then I was wondering um, in terms of the funds that we were supposedly going to get back from Auto and pg and &E, I think we got back from pg and &E. I was just wondering about Auto. So those are my two questions. So the first question regarding the oaks, they are doing well. Um, I haven't looked at them in probably six to eight weeks. Um, but I know they were recovering nicely from not just construction, they were starting to have distress before we started construction, but uh, we've fertilized them, done some deep root fertilization and removed all the dead wood in them. So they are doing quite well at this. As far as the payments, it's not auto construction, it's Noel and Tam that um, we are still waiting for a payment from. We did get one from pg and &E, though. Any other questions, Council Member Bertrand? No, your hands down. Uh, Council Member Brooks, did you have a follow up? No? Oh, okay. Um, with that, um, I will uh, open this up for public comment. Um, if there's members of the public that would like to speak on this item, uh, please raise your hand in the, uh, in the Zoom application um, or dial star nine on your phone. Uh, the moderator will unmute you and you will have three minutes to speak. Uh, anyone can also send an email to public comment, one word, at ci.capitola.ca.us. Emails will be read for up to three minutes. Um, Larry, do you notice, is there anyone that would uh, wanted to speak to us on this item? 
Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees uh, wishing to speak on this item, and we have not received any emails on this item. Okay, I'll bring it back to council for further deliberation and action. Uh, who would like to begin? Um, council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. So I'll go ahead and um, per your recommendation, not discuss the the item related to the tot lot since it's not on tonight's agenda. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I don't, I don't, I didn't want to cut you off in terms of discussion. Okay. But just careful about the action that we take on that item. Um, are there any other council members that have um, further comments? Is, is anyone want to put a motion on the table? Yeah. Uh, well, Council Peterson. I'll uh, move approval of the staff recommendation. Okay, I'll there's second. A, there's a motion uh, and a second. Um, before we take a roll call vote, I just want to uh, congratulate staff and, um, and Steve, particularly uh, you and your department, Public Works, uh, for completing this project. This is... Um, been at times a very contentious and difficult project. It's one that's had a lot of ups and downs, um, but um, I think it just demonstrates if you're positive and persistent, um, you can achieve, I think, wonderful things for the community. This library is um, a, a tribute uh, to Capitola and it is going to be for decades. And so um, congratulations for, uh, for uh, bringing it to this completion um, and also thanks to Auto Construction for being a great uh, partner with us uh, to achieve these results um, and, and doing it all significantly under budget. Um, and so with that, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Make a comment. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, Council Member Bertrand. No, that's all right. Um, yeah. I like to speak to the significance of the library. Um, not only is it a building that's getting a lot of use, um, you know, I've been going back and forth recently just to get a better sense. It's, it's definitely well accepted. And that's a major victory for this community. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is that um, the effort to bring together all the ideas and the various committees that were part of that that made this a success. Um, it impacted, I mean, excuse me, it involved quite a few people, uh, fundraising activities, um, a committee that looked at the, um, the plans to try to do value engineering. I mean, there's an immense amount of people that were involved in this and gave quite a bit of effort. So I, I think that says a lot about this community. Uh, another thing that I think is important is um, largely due to uh, Steve and the staff of City Capitola is Capitola has completed a major project. You know, we've had a lot of things that have kept the city going as it should be, and the citizens expect us to do this, but a library, its construction, planning, uh, funding, and everything, it's a major project. It's a project that we've planned and hoped for for a long time, going all the way back to RDA. Um, I remember the initial library across from the city hall, and then, you know, it went to trailers, and, and now look what we have. I, I think Capitola should be um, very proud of what we've done as a community and what to help the city staff to achieve this project, and it's very successful. So thank you very much to all those involved and to Steve with your final report. Yeah, Council, thank, thank you, Council Member uh, Bertrand. Um, is there anyone else final words before I call for uh, the vote? Seeing none, um, Chloe, can you uh, give us a, uh, uh, a vote? Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to uh, item 9B. Uh, this is a presentation regarding the city of Santa Cruz 
on-street parking program. The recommended action is just to receive a report regarding how the city of Santa Cruz is addressing oversized vehicles and an update on city of Capitola practices. Uh, can we have a staff report? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Council members. And yes, Happy New Year uh, as we begin 2022. So let me start. I'll share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen and hear me okay? Yes. All right, perfect. Valley. <clears throat> okay, so uh, good evening. Let me, let me uh, start by just providing uh, a, a little bit of, of my presentation tonight. So I'm here this evening to discuss the proposed oversized vehicle ordinance uh, currently in the city of Santa Cruz uh, that they're, they're proposing to, the, to their uh, citizens and then uh, they're talking about an oversized vehicle ordinance and then also a safe parking program. And so I will begin by providing a little bit of background. So during the November 2020, 2021 uh, City, Capitola City Council meeting, uh, staff was directed to research the, the programs that are currently being discussed in the city of Santa Cruz and the report back on the current practices that we're dealing with in, in, in the city of Capitola. So a little bit of history from the city of Santa Cruz. So they initially proposed uh, this oversized vehicle ordinance in 2015, 2016. Uh, so they actually adopted their oversized vehicle ordinance during that time. Uh, the city staff worked with the Coastal Commission and actually received a coastal development permit for that uh, ordinance. The permit was actually appealed by an advocate uh, to the Coastal Commission who had initially found what they called was substantial issue with the language. Essentially, anytime that there's an impact in the coastal zone, as far as parking goes, uh, they, they can weigh in on that or it does require a coastal development permit. And because of the appeal, it kind of stalled the process and so no action was ta taken. And so the, the, uh, the ordinance was never adopted. And so in 2021, uh, the city of Santa Cruz uh, decided to take another, another opportunity and created a, a subcommittee and they combined a wide variety of community stakeholders and, and did a quite a bit of public outreach. And, this, and that subcommittee came back with uh, essentially these two programs. So the one is an oversized vehicle ordinance, which has a uh, oversized vehicle permit program for residents and visitors. And then they also have this safe parking program that we'll kind of talk about a little bit later. So for them to even uh, approach the oversized vehicle ordinance, they had to define what an oversized vehicle um, actually is. And so they, their definition is that anything that's greater than or equal to 20 feet long or a vehicle that's greater than or equal to eight feet in height and then seven feet wide. With that, that that's how they've defined an oversized vehicle. And essentially, if this ordinance is adopted, there'll be no oversized vehicle parking from midnight to 5 a.m. unless it's either uh, permitted or that there's a variance that they've allowed for. Uh, part of the issues that they were trying to deal with, and I, I don't want to get into all of it, but they, um, they didn't want to have any of uh, the recreational vehicles or oversized vehicles plugging in or having gas or utility connections, open fires, um, and that kind of stuff. Um, I'll talk a little bit about their, the, what they're looking at is for their residential and visitor permits. So for if, if this ordinance is adopted, they, they will have an oversized vehicle permit program. And I don't know the cost of the permits. I, don't, I actually don't think that they've identified what the costs are. But the permits themselves depend on if you're a resident or visitor, but a residential oversized vehicle permit, they're valid for one year. And during that one year period of time, they're allowed to park their oversized vehicle on the street for four times a year for 72 hours. Um, and then same thing if a visitor came into their jurisdiction, it's the same thing. It's an oversized vehicle permit for a visitor and, and you can do the 72 hours and it's six times a year per address. So that's their, their, their oversized vehicle program and then their safe parking program, which is a fairly involved program 
is a city sanctioned um, or, or uh, city sanctioned parking lots or, par or sponsored parking lots that allow for overnight um, overnight parking or usage. And part of it is that they're going to, this three tiered program is they're going to work at um, identifying the, the first is trying to identify emergencies, safe parking spaces. So their goal is to have a minimum of, of three places, spaces designated. And they're just trying to assist with those folks that are, they're, need assistance with getting the registration or their or vehicles repaired. So they're not constantly getting citations and their vehicles towed, trying to give them just an opportunity to kind of get them to the resources. Uh, the next, next phase that they want to move into is a safe overnight parking. And this is what they call like the basic model where the, their, their goal is to get uh, 30 oversized vehicles. Um, part of that, that program is that they would, um, have overnight monitoring. Uh, they would also bring in trash and hygiene stations. And then the beginning levels of the, the health services and social services, they wanna start bringing that, folding that into those, um, those areas. And then the third program is, is more of a robust program where they expand existing program to the, and then they really wanna bring in health services and case management um, to really kind of bring a lot of those resources to those folks that, that, that need that assistance uh, that's a very vulnerable population. And so they have, those are the two main programs that they have. Um, and then let me just touch on a little bit of what we're doing here at Capitola as far as parking. So we don't have a, a oversized vehicle uh, permit program. Uh, we do uh, though have our municipal code that has the 72 hour limits. Um, it also covers all the parking uh, violations uh, Within that, there's also the California Vehicle Code, code that prohibits large vehicles from parking close, too close to the intersection. There's vehicle registration, other tra traffic related um, uh, sections with that. And then the other piece is that we do have a very uh, good program with our local businesses where we have a trespassing agreement where we get into a partnership with our uh, local uh, property owners and they, uh, they allow us to enforce their trespassing, uh, regulations on their property. They give us their authority. So that's been a very, um, well-received and very, uh, useful program for our department. And with that, it's just a quick overview of kind of what we have going on here, at Cap what's going on in Santa Cruz and what we kind of have going here in, in Capitola. And with that, I'm open for any questions or, um, in my slideshow. Yeah. Council member Bertrand, did your hand is up. Did you have a question for Captain Daly? You're on mute. Okay. No question. Any other council members have questions? Let's see. Oh, yes. Council member Kaiser. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chief Daly, I was curious if there's um, any locations or anything that are being tossed around specifically to Capitola that might be looked at for any of adopting any of these programs, um, or if that's just like we're just looking at Santa Cruz and sort of seeing how they're modeling this, and then if that's something that we would move towards. Sure. Yeah. So right now we, we don't have any sites that we're lo looking at um, as far as city owned or even even ones that are sponsored with faith based. I know that in Santa Cruz, they do have some faith based parking lots that they have um, outreach at. Uh, and so, like, like I said, my my report is primarily kind of looking at what Santa Cruz is doing. Um, okay. in that jurisdiction. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, member Bertrand. You're on mute. Yeah, so you just brought up something, Captain. Uh, so for private lots like Face Base or maybe Safeway or you know any of those other areas similar, um, would an ordinance that we pass apply to private areas? As far as the oversized vehicles? Yes. No, I mean, it's a private parking lot, so, so no. Okay, so short of an agreement with them because you want to help enforce private property issues, there's no way we could pass an ordinance that's something private. As far as the trespassing laws, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a program that we have and what we do is 
uh, it allows them, they ex basically extend their authority to contact right. people for trespassing on their property. So they extend that to our officers in lieu of them. Okay, right. Just want to be clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Um, seeing none from other council members. Um, Chief Daly, I had um, a question. It, it seems that the Santa Cruz um, ordinance prohibiting um, large vehicle parsing, parking from 12 to 5 a.m., that, that has gone into effect, correct? I don't know. I know that it was going, I'm, I'm not sure if it's actually been adopted. I know that there's other ju jurisdictions that have adopted similar type um, ordinances. And so I believe their process is still going through the Coastal Commission uh, permit process. And I, so I'm not sure if it's actually been adopted yet. Okay, so it may not have been adopted yet and maybe tied to the safe parking um, a, a component of, the, of that program. Um, and I, have you noticed any increase in enforcement or the prevalence of, of the large vehicle parking in Capitola? Uh, we, we do continue to, we, we see it. Um, uh, it does come in at times in waves, uh, but we're, like I said, we, we do make an effort. It's, it's, a, it's a very tough situation. It's a very uh, you know, vulnerable population that we're trying to you know, get the resources to, to, to them that, that, we, that we have. Um, but we do, you know, we do see it. And, and there are times where it's, where it's you know, more prevalent than others. Um, you know, we, with the summertime, it gets, it's a different, different clientele than the winter. Right, okay. Uh, well, thank you for your report. Um, I will at this time uh, open it up to the public uh, for comments. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, raise your hand in uh, the Zoom application or dial star nine on your phone, or you can write an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, do we have any members of the public wanting to speak on this item? Mayor Story, I do not see anybody wishing to speak in the audience and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, with that, uh, I'll bring it back. Uh, unless there's, I mean, this was just a report. There's no action to be taken by council. Um, do um, any other council members wish to make um, any um, comments on the item? Uh, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, Chief Daly, on, in, in correlation with what Mayor Story was asking you about the an increase, I think it's gonna be really important for us to have some sort of data um, in order for us to make any decisions or wanna bring things forward in regards to creating new ordinances or, or programs for the city of Capitola. So I don't, I'm sure you have something in place, but um, if not, my request would be that you start collecting some sort of data and where those influxes are and which areas are being impacted the most so that we can better serve our community and our, um, our members who are affected by those who park in their neighborhoods. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Brooks. That's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, any other council members have comments? Seeing none, I'm going to uh, close out this item and move on to item 9C. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Daly, for giving us that update and that report. Um, the next item, 9C, is to authorize purchase of a new street sweeper for the Department of Public Works. And the recommended action is to authorize the expenditure of up to 350,000 for the purchase of a new global regenerative air street sweeper. And that's a mouthful for the uh, Public Works Department. Um, Steve, tell us what a global regenerative air street sweeper Sweet. I'd be happy to. Boy, that's a tongue twister. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Let me uh, share my screen. So we're looking at purchasing a new street sweeper. 
quick background here is, uh, so I'm sure you all where the public work operates, operates a street sweeper five days a week. Um, we do have sweep weeks and non-sweep weeks um, where we, the sweep weeks are when we do the residential neighborhoods, non-sweep weeks, uh, we just focus on the arterials and uh, the village. We do sweep the village and 41st Avenue every day that the sweeper operates. Um, obviously we don't operate when it's raining and uh, our current machine breaks down quite a bit because of its age. Um, so there are days that we miss and uh, have had some long gaps recently due to uh, mechanical failure of the street sweeper. Um, the purpose of street sweeping is to remove leaves, debris, trash, uh, break dust, other pollutants from the streets, keep them, um, keep the streets clean and keep them from entering into the stream systems and ultimately out to the Marine Sanctuary in Monterey Bay. Um, we, I'd estimate we remove about four and a half tons of material on a yearly basis using a street sweeper. Um, so as I mentioned, historically, the sweeper has been purchased every five years. Uh, with the retiring machine kept for parts. Uh, we, we always seem to have two at the yard for a while. They both run. Eventually, we start scavenging the old one um, for parts, which is kind of where we're at now. I think it's what we have left from our older sweeper is just a shell at this point. Um, the current sweeper was purchased seven and a half years ago. We did delay the purchase because we wanted to make sure, um, we wanted to look and see if there's a better machine for us. Uh, at these costs, it's pretty significant investment, especially if we're doing it every five to seven years um, at, this, at the $200,000 to $300,000 in costs. Um, what we found is that, um, ah, there it goes. We're looking for a three-wheel sweeper. Um, there are very few three-wheel sweepers that are full size. In full size, we're talking about the capacity of the bins that you collect the debris in. Um, they do make larger four-wheel um, sweet sweepers, but they wouldn't fit in our streets very well. We basically just run down the middle. We wouldn't be able to zig and zag as we do now with the three-wheel machine. And it also, if you do get a three-wheel machine today, it's also very small. It has about a quarter of the capacity of the machine we've been using and are recommending. Um, we are recommending a change this year. In the past, we have used the broom sweeper, which I'm sure you've seen it comes. It has brooms on the outside and a broom in the middle that sweeps the debris into the uh, hopper, into the bin, the collection bin. Um, these brooms, we go through about a broom every, two, every about two a month, um, sometimes a little higher and it's very expensive. And there's also a, a lot of more movement and wear and tear on the machines. This year, we're recommending going to a vacuum style sweeper. It still has the brooms on the outside, which pushes the debris under the machine, but from there, it is a vacuum system to pick, to pick it up. We think this will significantly reduce the maintenance and broom costs. We know it will reduce the broom costs. Um, they are slightly more expensive on the order at this point of about $15,000 more, but we think that is a good recommendation. Um, so we're recommending, I'm just going to go with the Series 3 sweeper from Global Environmental. Like I said, this is a, the regenerative air refers to the um, vacuum purchase instead of a broom purchase. Um, the Global Environmental Series 3 is our current sweeper. We've been operating them for over 20 years. We found them to be very effective and uh, easy to work on. They're not without breaking out. Um, equipment of this size and the amount of use it gets um, do break down, uh, but we found that the, the uh, Series 3 has been a very good machine for us. Um, it costs a new diesel model, which is what we have now, it's $285,000. Global is offering for the first time an all electric sweeper uh, that is also regenerative air or the vacuum type. They hadn't ha they've had the broom type of electric sweeper in the past, but it's the first time they're having the uh, vacuum. Cost of that is $579,000, almost $300,000 more expensive, doubling the cost, over doubling the cost. When we first saw these prices, we kind of just checked and I looked at it and said, well, we're not going to do that. But as it turns out, Central Coast Community Energy, 3CE funding, is, provides power 
the green power through uh, out Monterey Bay Area um, is developing a program to assist agencies with converting heavy equipment to electric vehicles. Um, originally, we had approached them seeing if they would be willing to split the cost since it was essentially double the cost. Um, since then, the sweeper costs went from 2001 cost to 2022 costs, and they've gone up slightly. And 3C is, is preparing a program, but they're going, likely going to offer between $200,000 and $250,000 per purchase. Um, the 3C board is set to meet and discuss this item in, at their February policy meeting. So there is some funding that's potentially available to help us pay the difference for the electrical vehicle. So I'm just gonna try and summarize where we're at now. So the diesel is $285,000. The electric is $580,000. We originally recommended a city of authorization of 350, which if, we had, if the program had been at $250,000 was what we were originally led to believe it was going to be, that would give us $600,000, which would be sufficient to pay the, to buy the electric vehicle. If they reduce it down to $200,000, which they are considering, that would give us only $550,000 to make that purchase, in which case we would most likely fall back to the diesel purchase at that point. Just to be clear, I mean, the $350,000 is $65,000 we're already adding to the additional cost to help the electric. So um, if they reduced it down to 200, we'd be looking close to $95,000 that we're adding to our sweeper purchase. So that seems like a significant investment for something we're probably gonna last. I think soon it's gonna have the same life of five to seven years as the other sweepers. We do spend about $15,000 a year on diesel fuel. I can't even project how much uh, electricity we'll need. Probably a third that uh, would be a safe assumption. So there's some savings from going electric. Certainly the biggest advantage is just on the emissions control. So our recommendation at this point is to authorize the expenditure up to $350,000, meaning if we get the $350,000 and the grant from the um, 3CE is sufficient, we will move forward with an electric purchase. If it's not sufficient, we will go with the diesel amount. I will do want to quickly note that if the diesel purchase remains, the $65,000 um, that is being authorized over the cost of the diesel machine, that funding will remain in the equipment replacement fund. So that's my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. The questions from council members. Uh, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, Steve, how much do we have in our equipment fund in total for this year? Excuse me, I have to... Look at my staff report. I'm sorry. The current fund balance in the staff in the equipment replacement fund is $684,000. But there are, have some purchases already been approved from that for police vehicles and a public works truck. Okay. And that's what we budgeted for this year, correct? This that's is this correct. year's budget. And so Understandably, it's a lot of money, right? That for an all electric vehicle. And if we don't get it, it's still a lot of, it would be an, in, it would, we would incur a pretty hefty price. But the question for me is well, if we budgeted 684,000 and there's rollover for the following year, you know, I'm just, we budgeted, we budget this money to spend the money. And if I'm just curious whether there would be enough to, offset the cost in case we did not get the 3CE grant. Or a full electric? Yeah. So can I chime in here, Steve? So the way the equipment fund works is every year we put in an allocation based on all the different bits of equipment that the city owns. And then we depreciate that amount. And that's what our contribution into the equipment fund should be. So, for example, if we replace our police cars, let's just say to keep the math easy in my head on a four year cycle and they cost $40,000 for each police vehicle, we put $10,000 a year into the equipment fund. So the balance Steve shared with you is the total balance in the equipment fund and it includes sort of partially bought vehicles for the future. 
if you will. Um, so technically we do have the funding in the equipment fund to fund this whole purchase of a $600,000 sweeper. We haven't been depreciating the sweeper um, over the recent years to with enough funding into the equipment fund to do that. So I think it's a long way of saying, yes, there's the balance in there, but it would come at the expense of being able to replace other vehicles, unless we increased our equipment fund uh, contribution considerably in coming years. And so have we forecasted what the depreciation would look over a five-year span? So if we know that the sweet street sweeper is going to last for five years, and we have X amount of vehicles in the police fleet that need to be, you know, have you looked at that? Because what I'm getting at is that it's money, um, yes, but we also have the responsibility of making greener choices for, and this is something that is obviously an option to us. I'm just curious. Yeah, so we set aside approximately $50,000 a year for a street sweeper so that over five years, in theory, we will have saved up, there'll be $250,000 in the equipment fund for a replacement vehicle. So we haven't been saving up as if we were gonna buy a $600,000 sweeper. We've been saving up as if we were buying a 250. Now, Steve, and you will of course remember, Steve pointed out the fact that this sweeper's lasted us seven and a half years. Uh, so it has exceeded its depreciation cycle, uh, which does give us more latitude. Uh, and that does happen from time to time. So there is some wiggle room, um, but I was just trying to explain the way the equipment fund sort of works. Sure. Mayor Story, last question for staff um, is the is whether we have been notified by 3CE with this grant, whether it's a one-year grant or a two-year grant. So if we make this move and we only receive this one-time grant, then we also need to be making the decision to change the way that we're that we would have to be increasing the fifty thousand a year to ensure that we cover the cost of a future electric vehicle. Um, do we have any information from 3CE about whether this is an ongoing revenue stream or not? So at the 3CE uh, operations board meeting, yes, it, was, it may have been yesterday, I believe, which, which was when I received the update and heard about the $200,000 cap. Um, the impression I get from their staff is they do plan that this plan on this being an ongoing thing. Um, but you also need to remember that I think that there's 50 different members of, of Monterey Bay community power. So I'm sure in the future, there will be pretty significant competition for these funds. Um, so I think it's difficult to forecast whether it would be available in five or six years when we did need a new sweeper, but it's certainly not out of the question. And then I will also note, I think Steve mentioned this, is that ultimately the 3CE policy board of which you're a member is gonna have to review this heavy equipment replacement program and, and, and ultimately at the end of the day, um, decide whether the threshold or the max contribution should be $200,000 or 250, what the right threshold is. Way to call me out, Jamie. <laughs> I just wanted to point out you have a big stake in this one you can fight for us <laughs> and i will thank you thank you thank, thank you council member brooks for your role in uh, getting this um, grant um i'll call on council member kaiju thanks um i just was curious steve um looking at uh, the years to come. So we've been using the older diesel models to sort of supplement with the newer ones that we get. Um, and so is, will there be more complications with going electric and not really having a backup, you know, thing to pull from because it's a different operating system or does that look like it's gonna sort of be status quo and just sort of go about how it's been working for you. That's an excellent question, Council or Vice Mayor Kaiser. Um, obviously there's the, the machines going from a broom 
device to a vacuum device, there's not going to be as much equipment from the old one and then going from electric to power. So there, there will probably be some generation as we, if we stick with an all, all electric that we, the old sweeper won't provide as much uh, value as it has in the past. Okay. Yeah. Just curious, but it sounds awesome. Thank you. Uh, Council member Bertrand. You're on mute, Council Member Bertram. There. Um, Steve, sorry for the delay. Um, is this vacuum model something they've been doing for years and they have a track record of its efficiency? Yeah, there's always been two types of sweepers the vacuum and the broom. Uh, Global has made both of them for years to come. Um, when I got here, we, we used brooms. We've just never changed. And I think we're realizing now is a good time to make that transition. Okay. You talked a little bit about the difference in annual costs. Um, you talked earlier about repricing brooms and, you know, you hope this vehicle would be less. Uh, you just talked about, um, you know, the electricity, I believe, but do you have a better idea how much we'd be saving other than just electricity in terms of maintenance and equipment that you have to replace? So just from going to a, a, from, a, from a diesel to an electric, um, I don't have a good handle on that. Obviously, I just talked about the fuel cost, but the cost savings from going from a broom system to a vacuum system, system there's probably a significant savings upwards of twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a year that we already spend for brooms that we will will not need to purchase. I, I didn't hear that because my computer went out. Uh, what was that amount? Twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars in just in brooms that we spend a year. Okay. Um, so, do we have the charging equipment up at the yard uh, for this particular vehicle? We do not at this time, but. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what, what size we're, uh, or which voltage machine we'll be able to get, but uh, we have not priced that out yet. Okay. Hmm. So then there's the rundown of, you know, how many circuits to the city or whatever and charge up. And so we don't know. Do we have a sense of how much that would be? Because that would be part of the purchase. My price. guess is uh, looking, knowing charging machines these days, it'll be upwards, no, no more than $5,000. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, the council members with questions, um, seeing none. Uh, Steve, I wonder, are, are there um, other communities that have used this particular and electric uh, sweeper um, and um, you know, shared their experiences about whether it has sufficient runtime you know, charge time and I don't, you know, horsepower to do the job. It's, it's a little disconcerting that it doesn't have any longer life um, than, a, you know, a combustible a motor engine. Um, I will say most of the problem we have with the um, existing sweepers, not problems, but the wear and tear is actually with the, not with the motors, but with the, um, systems that pick up the trash and, and deposit the trash. So it's not the motors. Mm -hmm. um, in the life I gave it, that was my assumption. As far as other communities, um, some of my staff have reached out to, there are some communities in Northern California that have been using uh, the global electric broom sweeper for several years now. They have reported they have very favorable things to report that they were uh, sufficient, you know, enough power to do the job and didn't require uh, just charging them at night. They would run all they need for the next day. So um, there's not a whole lot of them out, out there, but uh, we did reach out and talk to some of the other users. Okay. Are operationally, are they quieter? I, I would think so. There's still going to be some hydraulic. Um, noise around for the uh, drive system, but they should be quieter than our existing sweeper, yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Steve. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, did you have a follow up question? Seeing none um, and seeing no other questions from Council Members on the report, um, I'll open this up to the public. Uh, if any member of the public would like to uh, comment, 
on this item, you can raise your hand in the Zoom application um, or dial star nine on your phone um, and the moderator will unmute you. You will have three minutes to speak um, or you may write an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Emails will be read for up to three minutes. Uh, Larry, do we have anyone uh, wanting to speak on this item? Um, Mayor Story, I don't see any attendees with their hands raised, and I do not see any emails on this item. Okay. With that, I'll bring it back to the council for further deliberation and possible action. Um, yes, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I just wanted to help answer the question you posed earlier about what other cities. Um, there actually are a lot, New York City, Denver, um, uh, uh, Oregon, and then the city of Chico, Caltrans. There, there are many, many um, mm -hmm. cities and organizations using electric sweepers. So we're just um, just jumping on the bandwagon to to support our our uh, environment by doing this. So with that, I I um, I I agree that we should move forward with the recommendation. Um, in, in light of getting the 3CE grant. Um, but I would like to pose the question of whether we can find the funding to offset the costs um, should we not get the, the grant from 3CE. My hope is that in six to seven years when it goes kaput, um, that everything will be green and we won't really have to look and the prices will will not be as expensive. Um, but I'd like to, to pose that that uh, tonight to council that we really try to adopt this as a move in the direction of um, in our, you know, in reference to our climate action plan and other um, things that we've really committed to within the city of Capitola. Yeah, is that a motion for the recommended action? Um, I don't think I so eloquently stated it. I'd like to hear what council thinks about um, offsetting the costs out of our current equipment fund should we not get the three CE grant. So I'd be interested in hearing okay. what other council Good. has uh, to say. Council member Bertrand. I don't know what in the budget right now could be carved away to support this. So I think it's critical that we get the grant, um, but I would support in budget hearings that we actually start putting aside money so that we can actually purchase, you know, a more expensive vehicle such as this. I think the, um, the idea of uh, providing something that is less uh, impactful on the environment is, is a good one to go. Thank you. Any other council members want to uh, respond to Council Member Brooks' question? Seeing none, um, I just want to, I, um, I guess, you know, I am supportive of us trying to move to greener solutions. Um, and uh, and, and I think at the introduction, I mean, at least for street sweepers, it looks like a lot of cities are using them, but they're going to be more costly initially. Um, and hopefully um, as they become more utilized, um, the costs will come down. Uh, I think that they are better for our environment, um, will meet our you know, uh, carbon reduction goals. Um, so to me, I think it's worth, um, taking the chance um, and making that transition. Um, and also want to, you know, being your representative on the Monterey Bay Air Board, uh, you know, the Air Board has grant dollars under its AB 2766 grant um, for, um, um, you know, equipment, uh, particularly electric equipment, because it reduces particulates um, in, the, uh, in our environment. Um, and that's what a diesel, you know, a diesel engine is, is putting out, um, you know, the kinds of particulates um, that um, the airboard targets. And so 
I think that that would be a um, possibility to combine uh, with uh, 3CE uh, to um, supplement the expense in the future. Um, so, so just, I mean, to respond to your question, uh, Council Member Brooks, um, I, I think that it is, I, I would be willing to, uh, you know, approve this action to um, make this transition to electric. Um, yeah, uh, Council Member Bertrand. I have a follow-up question to staff. Um, as I understand it right now, the sweeping program is partially paid for or maybe completely paid for by a grant. And I'm just wondering where the grant comes from, if this is correct. And is this something that they might support in terms of uh, environmental issues? I'm, I'm sorry, what program were you asking about? Uh, paying for the street sweeper program. I, 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 I thought this program is partially supported by um, an agency that doesn't want uh, debris to go into the ocean. And uh, am I incorrect? Yeah, there is, no, it's, it's, it's supported by the general fund at this point. There's requirements that mandate that we do the cleaning for stormwater pollution and things like that, but there's no funding associated with that. So okay. no, it's general okay. fund. My misunderstanding, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, Council member, oh, I thought you had your hands up, Council member Brooks, but oh, Council member Peterson. Thank you, sorry, I was trying to find the page in the, the packet that had the information that I was trying to, to reference. So um, it looks like if, so it looks like the program to cover part of this will be discussed at the board meeting in February. So, and forgive me, Steve, you may have already mentioned this and I missed it, but when would we expect to find out if we would get this grant that we're looking for? I'm gonna see if Jamie wants to chime in. I mean, I think they'll make the policy decision at the February meeting, um, as far as the availability of the funds, that's still to be determined, I believe. My understanding is that the funding would be available relatively soon after the program was authorized, I think. As soon as essentially the policy board took action, uh, I would be in touch with Tom and he would give us a letter of intent that would say, you know, go ahead and purchase this and we'll reimburse you. Steve, can, can you put the slide back up where you had the green check and the red check? Because I want to make sure everybody is on the same page about what the action is. Because I'm, I'm hearing some council members talk about uh, really committed to getting the the electric sweeper. Um, so right now with the staff recommendation, the only way we can afford the electric sweepers is if 3CE increased the grant amount from 200 to 250, which is entirely possible that they will do at the policy level. If you wanted to assure the city of, you know, regardless of the 3CE grant amount, um, that if we got anything from 3C, we would have to increase to almost 400,000 to from our equipment fund in order to make purchase with the electric sweeper. So I, I hope everyone's clear on that. I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page about what we're doing. Well, that's part of, part of why I'm asking when we would figure out if we were to receive this grant, because I'm trying to determine how it lines up with our mid-year budget reviews because it seems like if we found out around the same time that we weren't getting this grant, when we're doing our mid-year budget review, then it would be the perfect opportunity to say, oh, well, we have extra money here or we have surplus here. Let's make sure that we can put it towards the sweeper, um, which I'm a little bit more inclined to do than to just do it now. But I'm, I'm, that's what I'm kind of looking for some guidance on is would those two things fall in line to where you know we would, we would be around the same time of determining whether or not we're getting the money that we need at the same time when we're determining if we have the extra money to spend. Does that make sense? It, it does, it does. And I think the timing here can certainly work. It sounds like the council, so here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the council is very committed to trying to get an electric sweeper. So I think I think what we can do is, I'm sorry, I'm getting some, some background noise. Is there other people hearing that? You sound like yeah. there's a buzz with your mic or something like that. Is it me? Well, maybe, maybe it could be my fan. Let me. Uh... 
We'll see if that's any better. That's better. <laughs> Good. I'm sorry, everybody. It was a little disconcerting. Um, so it sounds like, you know, not to not to make a motion for the council, but it sounds like the council would like to see us is committed to seeing us purchase an electric sweeper. So I think what your motion would be is authorize the expenditure of up to four hundred thousand dollars for an electric sweeper. We'll apply for the three C grant. If we can get two hundred, great. If we can get two fifty, even better. If we don't get that, we'll return to council and present other options. Is that is that what I'm hearing from the council? If I may chime in, I just one question about on that, Jamie. Um, if we authorize four hundred, is that going to influence the three CE's um, policy decision? I I'm confident that our representative on the policy board is a very shrewd negotiator, and she may or may not tip her hand to the rest of the three CE board. <laughs> Okay, as long if if I'm assured that, then uh, um, I'm willing to go along with it. Mayor's story, I think, by us making this decision tonight, shows our commitment to clean, green energy, um, and that just we can utilize that uh, in our in our favor. Is there a um, council member that would like to make a motion? I can make the motion to, um, I guess, so now we're gonna allot for 400,000 to go towards uh, purchasing the electric global sweeper um, in the hopes that we get the grant from 3CE as well. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. And uh, second by uh, council member Peterson. Um, uh, just uh, on a clarification on the motion from staff, is it implicit in here that even with 400,000, if we have a budget shortfall, that we're going to default to the diesel street sweeper without coming back to council? Or will you come bring it back to us? Um, I think what I heard Jamie say is if we if $400,000 doesn't, and what we get from 3C isn't enough, we will return to the council. Um, either as part of the mid-year or a separate item to find additional funding. But we are committed to an electric sweeper. Yeah, thank That's you. What I heard. Right, thank you. Um, do the members of the council wish to speak further on the motion? Seeing none, uh, Chloe, can we have a roll call vote? Council member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Motion passes un unanimously. Um, yeah, thank you once again, Steve. Um, which brings us to item D, um, 9D. Uh, which is the uh, amendment to the fiscal year 2021-22 city fee schedule. The recommended action is to adopt the proposed resolution amending the fee schedule for fiscal year 2021-22. We start with the staff report. Thank you, Mayor Story, and good evening, my Vice Mayor Kaiser and council members. I have a brief staff report and I will share my screen right now. Okay, so um, by way of background, as you recall, we review the fee schedule each year as part of our budget process. And our current fee schedule was adopted this past June along with our, our budget. Since the adoption of the, the fee schedule, we have a couple of things that we'd like to make some uh, amendments to, and that includes our film permit program and our after school program. From, on the film permit side, so staff analyze our, our current film permit um, is a little bit clunky. Um, it's under, right now the fee is set under the discretion of the city manager not to exceed $3,000. And that's kind of all we have. That's all Jamie has as guidance. So 
it, it, it's not very clearly defined. So staff analyzed the workflows for what the city clerk's office, as well as police and public works departments do when issuing these film permits. And we broke them down into two categories, basic and major. Um, the chart that I have on the screen shows the amount of time that goes into each of those um, and by which department and actually which position in that department. Um, and um, the total city cost for the basic permit based on, on this calculation is about $107, but they also are required to get a building permit, which is $50. So staff is proposing for the basic fil film permit that we do the permit cost at $50, and then they'll also have the business license. And that gets them close to um, the 107 that we have on the screen. On the major film permit, a um, little more time involved and across more departments, our total cost based on this is about 482. We're proposing a, a setting the fee at 250 for this go around. And I, um, I'll just point out that on a major film permit, if we're talking like a big commercial or a, or a movie where we're shutting down streets and we need police in there, we, we recover the cost of those, any other staff that's involved in addition to the permit. So it, it wouldn't be $250 for them to come in and film a, another sequel to Transformers or something. Um, as far as the after school program, our current fee schedule lists uh, weekly and daily rates, which is a little bit confusing because the um, participants sign up for the after school program on a monthly basis. So uh, staff uses the weekly and daily rates to come up with a monthly um, amount for each month based on the number of days kids are either in school or in the after um, and in the after school program. Um, some of the minimum school days and changing school schedules related to COVID are, are, are again causing some of the confusion. So we're proposing to change the uh, daily rate to an hourly rate. And then that way we can look at the individual participant school schedule, because I believe we have three schools that um, participate in this program. And then based on the, each school's schedule for that month, we can determine how many hours of after school programming each participant will need and then they're paying for just those hours that they're there based on their school, school schedule. This will also, this also by doing it this way, and we do this now, um, allows our recreation staff to, to plan for the necessary staffing levels each month based on the, the um, individual school schedules. And I just wanna point out that we're not, at this point, we're not offering a drop-in or daily a la carte after school programming. Um, we're just using these hourly rates to calculate the monthly amount based on the school schedule for a given month. Um, and that actually ends my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Council Member Peterson. Thank you, Mayor Story. Uh, Jim, I think at the very beginning you mentioned um, that in addition to, if you go back to your first slide, you mentioned that in addition to the basic film permit, they need to get a building permit. Did you mean a business permit? Did I say building permit? I meant business license. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm. I was like, what are they building in this, in these movies? Okay, cool. No, I'm Thank sorry. You. It's business license. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll um, uh, open this up to the public. Uh, if any members of the public would like to address the council on this item, you may raise your hand in the Zoom or dial star nine on your phone um, and the moderator will unmute you. You will have three minutes. Uh, you can send an email to uh, public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Emails will be read for three minutes. Larry, do we have any uh, public comment? Story, I do not see any attendees wishing to speak on this item and we have not received any emails on this item. Okay, I'll bring it back to council for further deliberation and uh, possible action. Any council members that would like to begin? Don't 
don't all speak up at once. I can make oh. the motion to adopt <laughs> the, the fee changes. <laughs> Vice Mayor that. Kaiser has made a motion and uh, Council Member Peterson. I'll second that. It seconds the motion. Um, Chloe, can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Thank Which brings you. us to item 9E which is uh, appoint a representative to the Housing for Health Partnership Policy Board. The recommended a action is to appoint the city manager to a two-year term on the Continuum of Care Board, known as the Housing for Health Partnership Policy Board, as recommended by the mayor. And we have a staff report. Hi, um, thank you, Mayor Story. I'm gonna present something very quickly here on this item. Let me share, I haven't done this in a while and it doesn't get any less scary, um, <laughs> I can report. So can we see the present? Yeah, you're coming station? across, yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you, um, Mayor Story and um, members of council, this is gonna be a quick item of making your appointment to the Housing for Health Partnership Policy Board. A little bit of background. This is kind of like a trickle down situation where the county's former homeless action partnership is now called the County Continuum of Care Board, which is something that is required by the federal government in order to get certain types of funding. They've organized this to have local entities that address how to combat homelessness in our area. So as you may recall, last year, the city of Capitola, along with the county, adopted the Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz Strategic Framework. We had a presentation and council adopted that. And so the new continuum of care board is now called the Santa Cruz County Housing for Health Partnership, which is run and overseen by a policy board. And that board needs an appointment made to it. So the purpose of the board is basically overseeing the policy, establishing priorities. It's very technical and um, there's a lot of different responsibilities that the board will have. It's got different types of members, jurisdictional, operational, and then partner representatives. Basically Watsonville and Santa Cruz will each have two appointments where Capitola and Scotts Valley will share a seat between the two cities and alternate for two year terms. So all of the representatives will be on the board for um, two years at a time and then you'll make a new appointment. And the recommendation as the mayor said is to have all of council approve the mayor's nomination of our city manager, Jamie Goldstein to serve on the policy board. And that is really all I have to say. So if there's any questions, please let me know. And I believe our city manager can also help. Otherwise, you have your recommended action. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Are there questions? Uh, seeing none, I'll um, uh, take this out to the public uh, for any members of the public that uh, may still be with us that would like to address the council on this item, um, you may raise your hand in the Zoom application or dial star nine on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak. If you prefer, you can send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Emails will be read for up to three minutes. Um, Larry, do we have any public comment? Mayor, sir, I do not see any attendees wishing to speak on this item, and we haven't received any emails. Okay, I'll bring this back to council for deliberation and possible action. Does any council member um, like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to appoint the representative to the Housing for Health Partnership Policy Board to appoint the city manager, Jamie Goldstein, to the two year term on the continuum of care board. Um, 
yeah, I think I said it all. Yeah. I'll second that. Good. It's a motion. All right. And a second by Vice uh, Mayor Kaiser. Chloe, can we have a roll call oh, vote? That, that was me. Sorry. Oh, I, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> that was seconded by Councilmember Peterson. God, I almost made it through this meeting without stepping over my own feet. Um, so seconded by Councilmember Peterson. Can we have a roll call vote? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember Bertrand, are <laughs> did, did we lose him? I don't see him on my screen. I see him. See him. I see his mouth moving. Oh, okay. I think I approve. <laughs> well, there's three ways to mute or on mute. I was trying a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Brooks. Hi. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously, which uh, brings us to item 10, which is adjournment. Uh, thank you, everyone, staff and council members uh, and city attorney for helping me get through my first full council meeting of 2022. Um, and uh, it's um, a great year to all of you. Um, and I'll just close by saying, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. And we'll see you, uh, I'll adjourn this meeting to our next regularly scheduled meeting for January 27th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Good night. <laughs>